Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs and welcome to the second episode of Cup of Joe. And here I am with my Cup of Joe. And there was a lot of feedback about this cup last time. This is actually a different cup. This one's got a goat on it. The previous one had a giraffe on it. Uh, a lot of people got annoyed that I was holding the cup for the whole time, just holding it like this. So uh, I'm not going to do that this time. I will have a quick sip. And that's quite hot. Uh, and then I'll put it down on the desk in front of me. So um, nobody can make any complaints about me holding a cup. Here I am without a cup, but it is still down there. Uh, and the reason I wanted to make more of these videos is that firstly, there was some great feedback. A lot of people like the more relaxed format. And secondly, it enables me to share with you some information that doesn't merit a full deep dive video, but I think is quite important. And the first thing that I wanted to mention today was the fact that the Washington Post have now come out and identified a Ukrainian as being behind the Nord Stream pipeline bombings. The man in this picture is Colonel Roman Shavinsky. It shows him in a glass room in Kyiv where he is being held on charges of abusing his power during a plot to lure a Russian pilot to defect to Ukraine. Now he is the subject of another investigation. According to an exclusive from the Washington Post and Spiegel, he was central to the controversial bombing of the Nord Stream natural gas pipelines last year. Sources have painted a picture of him managing logistics for a six-person team that rented a sailboat under false identities and dove deep into the Baltic Sea to plant explosive charges on the gas pipelines. They say he didn't act alone and that his orders ultimately came from senior military officials. So I'm sure most of you will be aware of what's going on with the Nord Stream pipelines. But just in case you're not, back in September of 2022, the Nord Stream pipelines that were supplying gas directly from Russia to Germany were bombed and these bombings took place underwater. So somebody needed to know what they were doing. This wasn't just a casual passerby who dropped a depth charge. You needed to know where these pipelines were, be able to go down to that depth, lay those bombs and get away with it without anybody spotting you. And there's been a lot of speculation that the pipeline was bombed internally from Russia, that they sent these pigs that they have to actually clean out the pipelines with detonation devices on them and that the explosion took place from within. But there's also been accusations that it was organised by the West. But I think this is the first time that we've heard any tangible accusations against Ukraine. And the guy that's behind these bombings is actually under arrest in Ukraine at the moment. He was a senior member of the intelligence service and he's accused of actually trying to recruit a Russian pilot to join the Ukrainian forces. And that attempt apparently led to him giving away vital information, which led to more bombings in Ukraine. So there's no tangible evidence at the moment, but that's the accusation that Ukraine have organised this. Now, President Zelensky has come out and stipulated that Ukraine are not behind these bombings. But the speculation in the Washington Post says that that's because he wasn't in the loop. He wasn't actually told what was going on. They separated what was happening on the military side from what he was doing on the defence side so that he wasn't aware that these attacks were being planned and carried out. So, as I said, there's no actual evidence. Nobody's come out and admitted this, but that's the latest speculation. The question as to who did bomb these pipelines still remains up in the air. Nobody has a categorical answer, but I think this is the latest interesting development in that story. Okay, for anybody that's watching with coffee, time for a quick sip. And keeping on the theme of Ukraine, President Zelensky recently announced that he believes that Russia will be targeting all of Ukraine's infrastructure over the winter period, and specifically that Russia may try to attack all of the electricity stations to put power outages throughout the country because Ukraine gets very cold and obviously if you don't have any form of heating in your house, that's going to cause a lot of hardship. Now, interestingly, as a response to this, not from President Zelensky, but in other press reports, it's been reported that Ukraine is now considering attacking some of Russia's infrastructure, some of its oil and gas facilities in Russia as a direct response to what Russia is planning to do on Ukraine's infrastructure. And I think that would be really interesting because at the moment we've got movements in the oil price, which are caused on a daily basis, primarily by what's happening in the two conflicts in Ukraine and Israel, and also what's happening in the global economy. Because as we've talked about a lot on the channel, there's a slowdown going on right now. So demand for oil generally is falling. OPEC plus 
have been trying to counter that demand fall by cutting supplies. So they've been reducing supply so that the price goes up. So there's always that equilibrium between demand and supply that you have with oil. But if we now see attacks on Russian facilities, that could throw a further spanner into the works in terms of the oil prices, because we could see a genuine reduction in Russia's oil supplies in addition to their voluntary cuts that they've introduced that we talked about in videos recently. So I think this is a really interesting development in terms of what's happening in Ukraine. Up until now, Ukraine have been on the defensive, but if Ukraine decide to start attacking infrastructure in Russia, that could really turn up the heat on President Putin. And it'll be interesting to see what the retaliation is from his side. Okay, keeping on the theme of conflict, if you've been following the channel, you'll be aware that Hezbollah is an organization that sits within Lebanon. And this is also being funded by Iran in the same way as Hamas has been receiving money directly from Iran. And this is causing tension between Iran and the USA and has the potential to bring both of those countries into this conflict. That's something that nobody wants. And up until now, Hezbollah have really just been saber rattling. You may have seen in a recent video that I showed the leader of Hezbollah who came out and was issuing threats against the USA and various other parties, but it's just been threats. However, the conflict on the border between Lebanon and Israel is now starting to heat up. And Israel have now targeted a number of Hezbollah installations along that border. And video footage over the weekend has been released of Hezbollah destroying a number of buildings, which they say are part of the Hezbollah offensive. Now, Hezbollah have come out and said that they are very well armed and they are prepared to take this fight to Israel. In response to that, the Israeli prime minister has said that they are prepared to go and do in Beirut what they've done in the Gaza Strip, which is basically sending people on the ground, fire lots of missiles and basically raise the whole area to the ground. Now, if that happened, that would obviously then draw Hezbollah into this fight in the same way as Hamas is in it. And if that happens, there is a possibility that Iran will step up and try to support both of those organizations, which could draw in the USA. So I just wanted to mention this because I've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, the potential for Iran and the USA to get involved. And it's now been announced that the USA have launched their third round of airstrikes against Iranian bases that are in Syria. And since the fighting broke out in Israel, there have been more than 45 attacks on US bases that have been organized by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. So what we're seeing here is a definite increase in tension between the USA and Iran. And if Hezbollah does get brought into this fight as a result of what's going on on the Lebanese border, then that will definitely increase the possibility of both Iran and the USA becoming more directly involved rather than just standing behind the two parties. Now, one other thing that's happening this week is that President Biden and President Xi of China are meeting in San Francisco on Wednesday. And it's been reported that President Biden wants to talk to him about strengthening the military bond between the USA and China. So this is obviously in direct reference to what's happening in both Ukraine and Israel. The last thing that the USA wants at the moment is for China to be drawn into supporting Russia and Iran in those conflicts because that would then set up a brand new Cold War. And we've just got over the last Cold War, which finished in the 1990s. We definitely don't want another one. Now, President Putin has been working on the relationship with China. They've come out and said that they want an unlimited relationship, both in trade and other areas. So it's clear that President Putin would love China to join Russia in its fight against the West. However, President Biden is dead set on not letting that happen. The problem that we've got is that USA are currently sanctioning China on a number of fronts. And the most important of those is technology and microchips. And the USA has recently ramped up their sanctions against China to prevent them from getting the latest AI chip technology because they don't want China to overtake the USA because China is not applying the same sanctions against Russia. And therefore, if China had that technology, it would mean that Russia could get it and therefore it would weaken the sanctions that are currently in place against Russia, which are causing major problems. And as we go into the winter period, it will be really interesting to see what happens with Russia's oil and gas facilities because many of them are in really cold areas that need the latest technology to be able to keep functioning. And because they've now lost access to that technology and also some of the expertise because 
companies like BP, Shell, ExxonMobil have all left Russia. Russia is in a very vulnerable situation. So it would be very, very happy if China could be able to start supplying those latest chips. But as it stands right now, China can't do that. And it will be interesting to see how those discussions go between President Biden and President Xi and whether or not China asks for dispensations on the chip side of things in exchange for agreeing to more military ties. And finally today, I wanted to talk about artificial intelligence and chips and the Beatles. And now that doesn't seem like a logical progression because the Beatles is a band from the 60s and early 70s that is not really at the forefront of what's happening with technology. But actually, they are. And this is a great example as to how artificial intelligence can prove to be really useful in everyday life. It's not just for military applications and for the latest Bitcoin or some of the high tech thing. This can have everyday implications that can improve everybody's lives. And if you're a fan of the Beatles, you may be aware that they've recently released a new single, which seems incredible because two of the members died over 20 years ago. John Lennon died in 1980 and George Harrison died in 2001. So how can they be releasing new material? Well, this is all down to artificial intelligence, but not in the way that you may be thinking. This isn't something that's been generated on a computer using all of their voices and putting on artificial music. This is actually something really positive. So as I mentioned, John Lennon died over 40 years ago, but his widow, Yoko Ono, had a variety of cassettes of demo tapes that he'd been recording in his apartment in New York. And in 1994, Yoko Ono gave one of these tapes to Paul McCartney and asked him if he could do something with it to create some new Beatles material. Now, Paul McCartney thought that was a great idea. So in 1995, he got together with Ringo Starr and George Harrison, who was still alive at that point, And they subsequently created two new Beatles songs called Real Love and Free as a Bird. However, there was a third track called Now and Then. And the problem with that track was that John Lennon had recorded it on a piano in his home in New York. And unfortunately, throughout the whole of that track, you could hear a high hum that was apparently coming from John Lennon's electricity meter. And also the piano was so loud on the cassette recording that you couldn't actually hear some of John Lennon's vocals. Now the Beatles tried to do something with this track, but in 1995, the technology just wasn't good enough. And so they abandoned the project and now and then was left as the unfinished Beatles song. Now in 2021, Peter Jackson, who's the New Zealand filmmaker behind the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies, decided that he wanted to make a documentary about the Beatles called Get Back. And as part of that, he developed AI technology to be able to extract vocals and various pieces of music from the old recordings. And once Paul McCartney saw this AI technology in action, he asked whether or not there was something that could be done with the now and then recording. And the AI technology that was used in the Beatles documentary was able to extract John Lennon's voice from that dodgy tape that he'd made in his flat and we had a perfect digital copy of it. Now, the song itself wasn't actually complete. John Lennon had recorded all of the choruses, but he hadn't written all of the verses. So they had to then use some of John Lennon's vocals from old Beatles songs such as Eleanor Rigby to fill in some of the gaps. So the AI technology was taking real John Lennon vocals from old songs and putting them into this Now and Then track. And the two surviving Beatles, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr, recorded bass, guitar and drum tracks. And they also had a string section. And as a result of this AI technology miracle, the final ever Beatles song Now and Then was recorded and it was released worldwide at the beginning of November and Beatlemania is back in the UK. The Beatles are currently at number one in the hit parade. They've also charted in the top 10 in the USA and they've also hit the number one spot in a variety of other countries. And the reason I wanted to mention this was really to put into perspective how useful artificial intelligence can be. As I said, it's not just for military purposes or for gaming or Bitcoin. This can be applied to all different parts of society. And if you haven't heard that Beatles track, I would definitely recommend checking it out. There's actually a really interesting documentary on YouTube about how the song was put together. 
over the course of the last 30 years. So if you've got a spare 10 minutes or so, check that out. But as I said, I wanted to mention this because I think it really pulls together a lot of the things that we're talking about on the channel. We've mentioned artificial intelligence in lots of videos before, and I'll keep mentioning it again because I'm sure as we go forward, there will be more and more applications that nobody ever thought about that change everybody's real lives. So thank you for watching this second edition of Cup of Joe all the way through to the end. Still got my cup here, still got a little bit in it, which I'll finish at the end. And I had some more feedback from people saying, why didn't you include something to put a smile on my face at the end of the first video? Apologies for doing that. And here is something to put a smile on your face.